Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as we kind of all filter in, please take your time. I just want to um, extend a thank you to um, so much of the AMC staff who helped coordinate this, just with the emails and Skype and conference calls and things like that. So I definitely want to give um, a big shout out uh, to, to Judith and Meredith for arranging a lot of the logistics. Um, to Sandra, to Julian, to everyone who had been emailing back and forth about this. Um, I would also like to give a, a kind of shout out to uh, Katrina Hill, who was actually the originator of um, this particular panel. And I've just been, and Sally Block also, who invited me to kind of help moderate this discussion this afternoon, which I hope will be a very fruitful and interesting dialogue on some topics that were touched upon um, in Merritt Westerman's talk earlier, but also I think really speaks to some of the ideas and issues that are kind of happening in the curatorial profession. So I just wanted to kind of take a second to, to thank everyone for that. Um, and I'm just gonna uh, just kind of let you know how the panel's gonna work. I'm going to just kind of briefly introduce our panelists and then um, they're going to speak for about 10 minutes each, and then I'm going to speak as well, and then we're going to start a dialogue about this issue of uh, diversity within the curatorial field. And the way in which Sally and I had really kind of talked about this is that we didn't want this panel to be where we kind of just sit here and kind of talk, and then we have questions at the end. Once we kind of get the dialogue going, we really want this to be a dialogue and really have a conversation between us as you and the audience and kind of the AMC community, um, AMC community as a whole, to really make this about some takeaways that, um, for those of you who are interested in kind of implementing some very simple um, ideas and, and initiatives um, to kind of increase diversity in its myriad different forms to things that are very programmatic. So I think hopefully we'll have a really fruitful discussion this afternoon. So with that, let me introduce first uh, Joan Weinstein, who is the deputy, uh, director of the Getty Foundation in Los Angeles, um, and the co-director of the Getty's 2011 multi-site exhibition, that I'm sure all of you know, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, she received her PhD from UCLA and has written widely on 20th century German art. And I realized I didn't introduce myself. So let me backtrack <laughs> for a second. It's after lunch, you know we're not always here. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Kimberly Gant. Um, I'm an independent curator while I finish my dissertation um, at the University of Texas, Austin, so please pray for me as I do that, <laughs> Texas shout out. Um, and prior to that, I was the um, curator of exhibitions and public programs at the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora and Arts in Brooklyn, New York. So now you know who I am and not some random person just talking. That makes it much more fun. Um, our second panelist is Detroit-based, our own Valerie Mercer here at the DIA. Um, she is the first curator and head of the General Motors Center for African American Art here at the DIA. Um, she has degrees from art history at NYU and Harvard and has curated exhibitions both here and at the Studio Museum as well as uh, taught art history courses. And last but certainly not least, we have Ms. Candace Hopkins giving her international perspective. Uh, she's based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but bringing um, discussion on Canada. Um, she has curatorial projects including Close Encounters, The Next 500 Years, which was a multi-site exhibition in Winnipeg that she co-curated, as well as Sakahan, please, but I'm sorry I butchered that, <laughs> um, in International Indigenous Art um, that she co-curated as well um, at the National Gallery of Canada, most recent survey on Indigenous Art. And she's also currently the co-curator of the 2014 Site Santa Fe exhibition, Unsettled Landscape. So I think we're gonna have a really, really wonderful um, discussion this afternoon. So with that, let me introduce John Weinstein. Thank you very much. And Kimberly, can everyone hear me? Okay. And I'd like to thank Kimberly for organizing this panel and um, a former colleague, Julian Cox, who I haven't even seen yet, <laughs> who was the one who um, thought of including the Getty uh, Multicultural Undergraduate Internship in this program. So uh, shout out, thanks to Julian. <laughs> um, I'm gonna talk about this program, which began in 1993, and has, it's a minority internship program, and it's not just at the Getty, it's for museums and cultural institutions, across all of Southern California. So it's LA County based. And I want to tell you a little bit about the program and I'd like to talk a little bit more about the, the evaluations that we've done. So what we've learned about the program. 
And most importantly, I'd like to <coughs> highlight a couple of the issues that I think are worth discussing and that are um, sort of touch points for museums as they think about issues of diversity. So this is probably a little hard for you, those of you in the back to see, but the photograph on the bottom right is a reminder of why we started this program. This was the Getty's response to citywide discussions about race um, in 1992, following the Rodney King verdict and the civil unrest that broke out in Southern California. And it was thinking about what museums could do to increase diversity in their ranks. Because when the Getty looked around, um, as all of you know, um, everyone looked alike in, in, in these institutions. The goal of the program was to introduce undergraduates of diverse backgrounds to careers in museums and visual arts organizations. So it was not designed for the curatorial ranks, and it was not designed as a leadership initiative. This really was about introducing students of color who may not know about the kinds of work that goes on in museums to careers. It had the added benefit of helping many of the museums in Southern California who always were grateful for an extra pair of hands over the summer, um, but soon learned that it actually required a lot more from them. <laughs> So one of the keys is that these were paid internships. So this was 10-week paid internship for students. And we used the criteria of the University of California at the time. So if you were members of what were called underrepresented groups, um, African American, Asian American, Latino Hispanic, um, Native American or Pacific Islanders descent, you could qualify for an internship in this program. Many of you know that the University of California has changed its, um, no longer has affirmative action. Um, we've maintained these categories. And it raises two issues that I want to point out to begin with. Changes in affirmative action laws that impact minority internships in museums, particularly public institutions, and the issue of, in programs like this, whether or not to include Caucasians in the mix which was controversial in the beginning. And the other one I want to point out is this was a program um, directed at undergraduate students, and it raises the question of where in the pipeline do you intervene? Do you need to start in high school, undergraduate? Do you need to follow through in graduate school? Is it professional development for people later in their careers? So each summer, we have about 120 interns. And so far, we've had more than 2,900 interns at more than 150 organizations throughout Southern California. In 2000, the LA County Arts Commission joined the Getty and created a sister program for the literary and performing arts. So there are about 250 interns every summer paid working in the arts in Southern California. So what I'm already going to do here is um, I'm going to anticipate some of the results of the evaluations we've done, but to point to what actually were the key ingredients for successful internships. The first was a really dedicated supervisor. We learned that the key relationship for the interns was the supervisor that they worked with in the museum. These supervisors often went <coughs> above and beyond. They did reading groups where they included the interns for them to learn about issues in museums. They went to visit neighboring institutions where they could tour conservation laboratories um, or watch art, art educators at work. Also, that the, in, the interns had a defined project, so they were not there to make coffee, to do the filing, to answer the telephones. In the application process, they had to have a defined project that they could carry out and have some ownership and show, show results at the end of those 10 weeks. We also did a lot of programming for these interns, trying to create a cohort, a network to connect them to one another. We had outside mentors that came in and worked with them. 
And a lot of it was having mentors that looked like them, who were also people of color, in, where they, in, in situations in which they could have a safe place to have conversations about what it meant oftentimes to be the only person of color in an institution that they were working in. And this brings up another one of the issues that I think it's worth paying attention to, and that is the sensitivity of the institutions and the assumptions that are made by institutions when they have people of color working there. Many of the interns have told us that everyone assumed they were poor because they were a minority. Many of them came from very upper middle class families and some of them were actually very familiar with museums. Many of them were asked to represent their race or ethnicity. You know, I'm coming to ask you what the African American community thinks about X and how we can bring them into our museum. Some interns loved being in that position. Others were incredibly resentful and said, I want to be treated like everyone else in this institution and not singled out for my race or ethnicity. So it's having those conversations within the institution um, to be able to understand where the interns or where people working in the museums may be coming from. We also did something we called the Art Summit. We did do, it's, it's really a large career day where we bring all the interns together and they get to speak with curators, conservators, exhibition designers, art educators, um, preparators, uh, you name it, so that they can actually see all the different career paths within museums. So I'll talk a little bit about the evaluations and what we learned. This may be hard to see from where you are, but it shows the basic demographics. About 75% of the interns, um, and this, this goes to the first um, very large outside evaluation we did in 2008, uh, three-fourths of the interns were women and one-fourth men. Uh, about 41% were Asian American, 39% Latino, 13% African American, and declining representation from there. Go ahead one little bit here. In the 2008 um, survey, and wow, those numbers really don't show up, what we learned was that 32% of the interns were working in museums and visual arts organizations. And it was a much higher percentage than we had ever expected because um, students did not have to have a background in the arts to participate in the program. 81% of them attributed their decision to work in a museum to their internship. And I think there were wonderful byproducts. 81% of them visited museums on a regular basis as a result of the internship. Uh, many of them donated to museums, volunteered at museums. So wonderful results, even if they didn't wind up working in the museum field. But in looking at those who are working in museums, um, based on that 2008 survey, 81% were women. So even higher percentage of those that, that participated um, in the program. 48% uh, were Asian Americans, slightly higher than their proportional representation. 29% Latino Hispanic, so about 10% lower. And 12% uh, African American, um, about proportional to their participation in the program. We did another um, survey just recently in 2012, and it was really to track tra uh, career trajectories and to evaluate the impact of multiple internships. And uh, we were very gratified to learn that 42% um, of the former interns were now working in museums and visual arts organizations, and it actually increased. And part of that is that we had um, allowed students to begin doing multiple internships. So those who did three internships 67% of those went on to work in museums and visual arts organizations. So where are they working? They're working at the Getty, at the Broad Art Foundation, at MOCA, Smithsonian, Guggenheim, LACMA, 
um, many of the larger institutions, but many small visual arts organizations, particularly in Southern California. And we can see from their career um, trajectories, many of them enter at lower level positions. In small organizations, their careers progress quickly. We had a number of executive directors of small community-based arts, arts organizations. Um, those who worked in larger museums often found that they needed to go back and were going back to graduate school, particularly if they had any hopes of working in curatorial. We had some working in art law. We had people working in um, for-profit sector in galleries. But I'd say the largest majority of them were in public programming and in art education. So the areas that you would naturally assume have community outreach. Um, I'm just going to end on a very, very brief note, and that is that we have been following up because it's clear that there's a great desire among this cohort for professional development. We've been providing support for former interns to attend annual meetings of AAM and also the California Association of Museums, both of which have very strong diversity groups at their annual meetings and have folded the interns into these programs. We also recently did something called Leadership in Arts Management, where we did a one-year program for former interns who were, um, had the potential for leadership within their museums or arts organizations. And um, one of those has already gone on from being a curator at the Seattle Art Museum and is now a deputy director of a museum in Shanghai, and others are also progressing on the career ladder. So I want to leave you with this, that this is a, you know, I think this is one avenue in diversifying staff through internship programs, but it is by no means a silver bullet. <laughs> um, it is a long process, and there is still not the sensitivity, I think, on the part of museums and to have the difficult conversations that need to happen within museums. Even those students who have gone on and are now probably the most advanced in their careers in some of the more successful museums, the larger museums, often feel extremely isolated and are looking for ways to connect with peers um, in other venues. One final thing that I'll leave you with, I think the institutions that have done the best job working with the interns and creating that next generation that can go and work in the larger museums are the mid-sized museums and the college and university museums. In large museums, the interns tend to get siloed and do not get a sense of how the larger museums work. So I think this is a challenge for um, large, particularly encyclopedic museums. Thank you. If you want to, it's Edgar. Oh, here you have this. Oh, yes. yes. Move right. forward. Sure. So, hello, everyone. I'm Valerie Mercer. I'm the curator and uh, department head for the General Motors Center for African American Art here at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And uh, since this is my home here, so to speak, uh, in my home away from home, the that's the institution itself, uh, welcome and uh, thanks so much for being here in Detroit. It means a lot to us. I, what, what I want to do is tell you about my position here because it is uh, still um, a, an unusual uh, one in museums today, um, but it does have a lot to do with, I think, some uh, real thoughtfulness about um, Detroit and what the museum um, hoped to achieve under our uh, current director. So I'll just begin by explaining that I came here in September uh, 2001. That was um, actually a week after 9-11. Uh, uh, I came from New York. Um, I arrived at the DIA to assume my new role. Um, my department had been recently established in about 2000. I think uh, Graham Bill made an announcement about the department 
and then spend about a year um, looking for a curator to uh, head uh, the General Motors Center. The center functions as a curatorial department providing resources for developing special exhibitions, lectures, and programs on African American art. Its goal is to enhance public knowledge of African American contributions to the art community while exploring American history, society, and creative expression from an African American perspective. As far as uh, we are aware, the GM Center is currently the only curatorial department um, dedicated solely to African American art within a mainstream encyclopedic museum. It collaborates with the staff of various other departments at the DIA, especially um, curatorial, learning and interpretation, uh, the research library, public programming, and marketing to raise awareness of the DIA's programs, lectures, activities, and events focused on African American art and culture. The um, GM Center for African American Art, as I mentioned, was established by Graham Beale, our current director, um, and is a result of a generous gift from General Motors. After being at the DIA for a couple of years, um, Director Beale felt strongly that the museum, located in a city with a population that is around 87% African American, needed to increase its outreach to that community by emphasizing respect for the contributions of African American artists and the work of scholars and curators who specialize in um, this area of study. Since I arrived in 2001 to set up the GM Center, I um, at that time, I hired staff, uh, developed a collection plan as well, assessing the strengths and weaknesses of the museum's African-American art collection. The objective was to build up the existing collection through the acquisition of paintings, sculptures, installation art, new media, to better exemplify the, the diverse interests and artistic approaches of African-American artists in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. Um, this I saw as essential to educating the DIA audiences about the ongoing development of African American culture and history. Uh, I've met people, not necessarily just here in Detroit, who, who would somehow assume that you know, African American art pretty much started in the 20th century. They really didn't know anything about um, 19th century African American artists. Currently, um, this area of the museum's holdings consists of approximately 600 objects, the majority of which uh, date from after World War II. Because art and cultural historians are broadening the definition of African American art to include art of the African diaspora in the Americas, the GM Center has expanded its scope as well with approximately 25 paintings and metal sculptures made after 1970 by Haitian artists. And this is because we had a, uh, a wonderful uh, local collector uh, who donated directly and indirectly um, these works to the um, collection. He was of Haitian uh, heritage. And uh, when I worked at the Studio Museum, I mean, we had a collection besides African American art, we had African and, but I, I learned a lot about um, art of the um, African diaspora in the Americas because we had, um, you know, art from the Caribbean, um, particularly work by Afro Latino artists and um, artists from, you know, Jamaica, uh, Barbados, other places, um, and, and of course Haiti. Uh, now, let me see. Um, the galleries that we uh, developed uh, to present this art, which was an important impetus for strengthening co the collection, these galleries were developed um, in, um, as part of a broad uh, reinstallation and renovation project that was completed in 2007. It was a museum-wide um, project. The galleries are organized around themes pertinent to the history of African-American art and the vicissitudes of the African-American experience from the 19th century through the present. 
So the first gallery deals with the theme of African American art of the um, 1800s or 19th century. And this first gallery is located within the museum's American wing, focuses on how 19th century African American artists uh, entered the fine arts professions. Um, and they did this through the, the help of quite a number of uh, collectors who were also um, abolitionists. So um, I'm not gonna show you every object in the collection, in the uh, galleries. We have about, these galleries enable us to consistently have um, on view about 82, somewhere between 80 and 85 works of art on view um, by African American artists, but consistently on view, which is again, uh, pretty unusual, you know, unless it's a place like um, the Studio Museum, but it's not typical of encyclopedic museums like the DIA. Uh, <clears throat> so this uh, beautiful painting by um, Duncanson is one example of the work we have in the gallery. And it's um, uh, work, um, this particular painting was, is regarded as one of uh, Duncanson's masterpieces. Uh, this is done about a year before his uh, death in uh, 72, 1872. And it's, uh, inspi it was inspired by his love of the poem, um, Lady of the Lake by uh, Sir Walter Scott. And crit critics gave him a great deal of acclaim for how he captured the uh, light here. Um, but it is as, as well, uh, you know, even the scene based on um, uh, what he actually saw. He did travel to Scotland because um, he exhibited his work there, but also um, some aspects of the poem play a major role in this. And, um, okay, and, because uh, <laughs> I can get hung up talking about the art. And um, so, but we have quite a few uh, Duckinson paintings um, in the collection. And there's well in that gallery, uh, uh, works by Edward Mitchell Bannister, Tanner, uh, Edmonia Lewis, and Thomas Day. And this is another thematic gallery, New Art for New Self-Awareness. This has to do with, um, uh, you know, the impact of the Harlem Renaissance on African American art, where African American artists began to define the image of their people due to the um, urging of the black intellectuals like Du Bois and Elaine Locke. So this is uh, an example of one of the works on view there. We have quite a few um, paintings by uh, Huey D. Smith in our collection, but there's also Augusta Savage in this gallery, Buford Delaney, and other wonderful artists. This is um, another gallery, because we have five, five galleries altogether, four of them are in modern and contemporary. This is one called Expressing Political and, the, and Social Consciousness, uh, and talk, deals with how African American artists began to deal with political and uh, expressing their political and social consciousness um, during the time of the uh, 60s and this civil rights movement. Uh, sort of emboldened the artists to do this, and one of those artists was Benny Andrews. Um, but there's other powerful work uh, in that gallery too. Examining identities has to do with how contemporary artists today deal with the complexities of identity in the world they live in today, because it is different from what Harlem Renaissance artists would do. This is a good example, Betty Saar. She, here she's dealing with uh, African Americans hangups uh, regarding uh, light skin versus dark skin, uh, how that still is um, a, 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 an issue in our communities. Um, and then this last one uh, is African American art after World War II and deals with all the um, progressive changes in African American art as a result of the uh, uh, advantages the artists gain from the GI Bill, their ability to uh, begin to study at various schools. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> and this is uh, Bob Thompson, who's in that gallery, uh, along with a number of um, abstract artists. Uh, and I'm good, just gonna show you a couple of really, um, I think, impressive, uh, you know, paintings uh, and a sculpture we have, one by Kohinda Wiley. That is in the contemporary art galleries. What I do is collaborate with our contemporary art curator to put in um, certain works within 
uh, the other galleries so that they are presented in a more global context. So that's the case with Kehinda Wiley's piece and with this uh, wonderful piece by Fred Wilson, which is a, a recent acquisition. Um, gaps in the collection needed to be filled out to flush out secondary themes in each gallery. And as a curator, I was able to accomplish this by focusing on opportunities to acquire art you know, at galleries as well as auctions. And local co collectors were also generous in loaning me uh, works of art uh, for the galleries. Um, I do rotations. It just it, it, okay. It, okay. I, 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 I do rotations uh, uh, of about 15 works on paper in the um, in each of my galleries. I do that about every three months. But I work with again collaborate with the um, curator of prints, drawings, and photographs. Uh, um, ultimately, the African American art galleries make it possible for this city's majority community to see itself reflected in the art on view in the DIA, a world famous institution, and thereby assist the museum in realizing its mission statement, which is the DIA creates experiences to help each visitor find personal meaning in art. Thank you very much. <laughs> Trying to keep and, this and on time, you, sorry. I, 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 I did time myself, <laughs> but you know, I get to this probably the works of art and go off. Actually okay. from Canada, from the Yukon, in fact. Um, and I want to speak specifically about uh, change in Canadian institutions that, uh, that is particular to Native North American art, uh, which encompasses um, First Nations or Aboriginal art, uh, as well as other, as well as the hiring of native curators in museums and, and galleries across Canada, which has been increasing, particularly over the last 10 years. So for me, there are three key moments with regards to the exhibition and collecting of native North American art, as well as to this increased hiring. Um, the first goes back a little bit uh, before this image that we see behind me, and that is uh, the Indians of Canada Pavilion that was organized as part of Expo 67 in Montreal. I don't know if anyone had a chance to see it. Um, in quite a brilliant move, uh, initially the, the pavilion was meant to be organized by federal bureaucrats, but instead they decided to hand it over to a group of young artists. Um, so this included uh, a then unknown uh, Norval Morisot, Carl Ray, Tom Hill, Alec Janvier. It also included a display of Inuit sculpture. Um, but they immediately recognized this as an opportunity to tell the history of Canada from a different perspective, um, to represent art and social life from Native people themselves. So the exhibitions inside explained the painful legacy of forced assimilation of residential schools, uh, there's one didactic panel that explained how the children's stories that were taught in schools at the time uh, that explained things that Dick and Jane did didn't really resonate with a native child living on an Indian reserve. And then others portrayed the disconnect that children, that children felt who were forced to speak English rather than their mother tongue. Um, the pavilion created something of a rupture. It wasn't a promotional display of Canada's Indians for a world audience, but an art project that sought to communicate the realities of being Indian in Canada. Native interpretive guides were hired for the duration of the exhibition, and my favorite story goes that the queen visited the pavilion, and she left after about 10 minutes ashen-faced shortly after entering. <laughs> Second is the creation in the 1970s and active throughout the 1980s of a group of artists who called themselves SCANA, and that was the Society for Canadian Artists of Native Ancestry. SCANA was, in fact, an arts advocacy group. Uh, they were founded by a group of artists who, for many of whom had just uh, graduated from art school but still weren't uh, gaining entrance into any, any either local museums and also major museums and also collections. So SCANA lobbied major institutions to both collect and exhibit native art. And after their formation, places like the National Gallery of Canada, uh, where I spent the last four years, purchased their first works, and this was only in 1983, finally choosing to include these works first and foremost as art and not ethnography. Scanna was also involved in the 1988 protest of the exhibition that was called The Spirit Sings, 
a survey of native objects that corresponded with the Winter Olympics in Calgary. And at the forefront of the image, you see uh, performance artist Rebecca Belmore seated in a display case. And she's uh, listed there as artifact, I think it's 6718B. Um, this exhibition sponsor, as you can tell by what she's wearing uh, across her chest with shell oil, a hypocr hypocrisy that the Lebakon Lake Cree, a community whose rights to their land, land where, active, where Shell was actively drilling and still drills, had never been formally acknowledged by the government. Because of the widespread criticism of the exhibition, one which did not represent the present realities of First Nations people, or even make the case that First Nations people were indeed present, um, a task force on museums and First Peoples was created in 1992, and I think this is really important because the task force really did create a, a ground shift in terms of museum and gallery practices in the nation. And so the task force contained a number of recommendations for museums that are now common practice. One, which seems basic, but at the time it wasn't, um, was that when museums display native art and aesthetic objects from which those, they also have to consult the communities from which those objects originate. At the same time that the task force was created, one of the consultants, Mohawk curator Leanne Martin, who worked for many years at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, founded a program uh, called Residencies for Aboriginal Curators, and it was funded through the Canada Council for the Arts, which is our version of the NEA. So this program also changed the makeup of galleries and museums, if only temporarily. So candidates apply for a one to two year residency at a host institution of their choice. And this is also how I got my start at the Walter Phillips Gallery at the Bant Center after I graduated from Bard. The Canada Council pays the bulk of the salary for the resident, and the host institution provides the budget for exhibitions, publications, administration, and the like. There have been dozens of successful residents since its inception. The, its main downfall is that the residency program has not once uh, resulted in a permanent hire of those residents at those institutions meaning that the diversification was short term, but has resulted in, in the proliferation of a number of highly trained independent curators, of which I am one. In recognition of this, a number of self-employed former residents banded together to create what is called the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective. This collective now has over 200 members. It's one of the most active in Canada, if not the most active curatorial collective in Canada. Um, and affiliates. It hosts an annual symposium and has produced publications that critically engage with Aboriginal curatorial practice and its exhibition history. The ACC has also engaged in studies of the field. Aside from the Aboriginal curatorial residency program, real steps towards diversifying museum staff, particularly as it concerns uh, Native people, are because of the creation of a number of endowed positions. Um, and these are actually the result of a single patron, Michael O'Dane. O'Dane's gifts uh, established the position of the Curator of Indigenous Art at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa, where I was based for the past four years. This is it. Uh, which then led to the establishment of the Department of Indigenous Art, uh, collecting and exhibitions um, activity spans from the 1920s to today with a particular focus on contemporary art. Acquisitions are a significant activity. In 2013, the department which I was formerly a part of acquired over 100 works for the collection, including Inuit art, the holdings in span uh, nearly 3,000 works. In fact, they might have surpassed that by now. What was first a gift of an endowed position has radically changed the museum landscape in Canada, and it's a useful template that will hopefully be, enact be enacted by other institutions. I also wanted to note that the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, also through a gift from my, Mr. O'Dane, has an ongoing fellowship for Aboriginal curators, of which each fellow works with the museum for a period of one year, and is very process-based. It's not necessarily towards the development of an exhibition, although it can be. So what I'm showing behind you uh, is the exhibition Sagahan, which I helped co-curate. It was a survey of global indigenous art, included um, 82 artists, from 16 different countries, uh, well over 200 works. And in fact, it was the largest exhibition of contemporary art ever held at the National Gallery of Canada, which itself is a, is a big achievement. Um, it occupied more than 40,000 square feet inside the museum, and then a number of sites both uh, on the museum grounds as well as uh, throughout the city and as far away as 